inside the all-new, all-electric F-150 Lightning. And to be honest, the interior space is largely a carryover from the regular F-150, and that's by design. Their customer base didn't want a science project. And this interior space, as we've gone on in length, is probably the best truck interior. You have enormous door cards, you have very comfortable seats, you have good interior cargo capacity, you have good visibility, there's an enormous amount of glass in this vehicle, and in this Lariat trim, with its enormous moonroof, with it open, you genuinely have this giant greenhouse in this vehicle, which means it gets very hot in the summer, but you have good visibility. The receipts fold up for maximum cargo capacity, and you could be a whale and get back there and have no issues whatsoever. The bed space is fairly traditional. And just like in your regular F-150s, with the Pro Power onboard system, your generator, you have some plugs back there, like a 220 and some other plugs, which means you can run a worksite. And we're gonna talk more about that in the shop. The three primary differences between the regular internal combustion powered F-150s and this Lightning are you have two different screens in the interior space. You have a gauge cluster that promotes some EV settings. If you go up to the Lariat trim level, you have an enormous 15 point five inch display in the center, which looks like a tablet, doesn't add any functionality and removes a bunch of physical controls, which is a big boner killer. And then in the front, you have a frunk, which is 14 cubic feet. It has four plugs and it has a drain, which can carry about 400 pounds of total weight capacity in the front of this vehicle. And because of that, you finally have an enclosed cargo space that doesn't rely on your interior space in an F-150. But with that, it's time for us to head into the shop. We're under the brand new Subaru Wilderness, Jack. Are we, Mark? I thought this was the Ford Lightning because this thing's built Ford tough. Oh, well, you've been paying attention. You're a student of their marketing platform. Let's say you want to learn about the F-150 Lightning and all the engineering. We were certainly interested in how you turn a massive seller into a, a full electric truck. Not even a massive seller. The most sold vehicle oh, in America. There, you're back to the marketing. I have That's to. the first I've thing. I've injected it into my soul. What, what other marketing tidbits can you talk the about? The UAW, America, immigration story, success story, future. We tell you about the future, Mark. Yeah, it's, it's, more, it's one of the most disheartening like exercises I've done in a long time. We don't know a ton of the engineering because I, I, I truly believe they took the parts that they could take from the regular F-150 so they didn't have to re-engineer everything. You know, clearly they had to make some serious changes to suspension geometry, to damping, to bushings, to accommodate all the weight, the battery pack shift, the weight balance difference. And they built a whole plant for this car. The Rouge plant was basically spun up for this vehicle and they claim by the middle of next year, about 150,000 electric F-150s or more are gonna be rolling off the assembly line. So clearly this was a big feat, but we don't know a whole lot. I'm gonna walk you through what I do know though. Sounds good. So body, obviously we talked about it in the interior segment, they made some changes, but from an exterior perspective, they prioritized the, the aerodynamics of this vehicle. The coefficient of drag was changed, which for a truck is a big deal. So at about 75 miles an hour, this car requires 10% less energy than it would otherwise. You have two battery packs and that's what dictates the power output of the electric motors. From my understanding, the electric motors front and rear are identical. However, if you have the 98 kilowatt hour battery, it produces in the low 400 horsepower range, but it still makes 775 foot pounds of torque. If you go with the massive 131 kilowatt hour battery, which is what we have in the extended range, which at a minimum costs $20,000 more than the smaller battery, the horsepower goes up to about 580-ish which means this vehicle, as we're gonna talk about in the drive, is ridiculously fast for a vehicle that weighs 6,500 to like 7,000 pounds. This thing's a very heavy truck. It is zero to 60 in four seconds and the quarter mile in 12.7, which in an F-150 is absurd. The front is more, the, this truck's it's more traditional. aerodynamic because the underbody is much flatter than a traditional truck. Mm -hmm. You don't have a drive shaft. You don't have the exhaust manifold. You don't have the exhaust in this. So you can smooth out the underbody and channel air that you couldn't do before. You don't have a center, huge differential in gearbox. The front has a closed front because you don't need the, the grill openings so they can smooth out airflow there. So that's how they make up the big benefit. The front suspension though is fairly traditional looking. Yes. It's double A arm in the front. 
non-adaptive damper is kind of what you're expecting from an F-150. I'm sure most of the front geometry is probably somewhat carryover. Obviously, all the bushings and the spring rates had to be changed for the weight. The rear is radically different. It's an independent rear suspension with the biggest rear aluminum control arms I've ever seen in my entire Those life. Those control arms probably cost, as a pair, at least $5,000. I wouldn't be surprised, like, I wouldn't be surprised if you got it in a, a rear end collision, a minor one, and you screwed up one of those control arms, an insurance company would be like, oh man, we're gonna total this thing out. I mean, it is, it, that combined with the battery part. So like we talked about originally, they carried over probably as much as they could in the suspension mm -hmm. on the front, but you know, the back is, is that, I mean, it's just a whole different vehicle. There's no stick axle in the back, which for towing, and I'm gonna talk about towing here in a second, is probably a con, but for ride quality, it's a dramatic improvement and it should handle a little better. Again, this is still a truck. When you're in the when you're driving this vehicle, still some of the bobbliness of a, mm -hmm. of a truck, a body on frame vehicle. But in the rear, it rides better. I do think the reason they went to an independent is both because of the electric motor layout, the mm -hmm. packaging associated with it, and the battery pack packaging did not allow them to use a stick axle in the back of this vehicle. Well, and they needed to fit a battery pack that goes farther back yeah. for extended battery packs. So more cells means you're pushing everything farther. The other reason to uh, let, let's talk about some of the strategy because now we're dealing with two electric motors that are not connected to each other. That means you're dealing with electronic tuning along with battery state monitoring and load. Yeah. So this is something you don't have to deal with with traditional EVs. So what they've done here is they've put weight sensors so you understand the car or truck understands how much load this thing is under at all times. So a part of that electronic tuning is understanding battery range and translating it to the customer who's driving it. So depending on the weight that these sensors pick up from overall capacity and towing, it can adjust that range electronically to tell you, okay, if you have 9,000 pounds behind you, you're gonna be down to like 100 miles or less of range. But if you half that load, it's going to accommodate the fact that it knows what weight you're pulling and will up the range based on that. And it's all an approximation. Again, we're in the age of electronic tuning of every system. The other thing I'm gonna talk about now is towing towing and the generators on board okay so towing this is kind of the i'd call the elephant in the room this thing still tows like over ten thousand pounds but range becomes a big issue not under our testing but under some other independent testing yeah. from different outlets and essentially if you're towing around a six thousand pound trailer you have a hundred miles of range which basically eliminates this for long distance towing for really the main reason is infrastructure yeah. if you're towing long distance you can't stop one every 100 miles. And if you stop at a traditional EV America station, where are you gonna park this thing if you have a giant trailer? You're gonna be eating up the entire parking lot. It's not a practical towing vehicle. However, the range is, in, is not a big deal if you're a regular contractor and you have a fixed radius. The fact that you don't have to fill this thing up with traditional gasoline, yeah, yeah. it should save you a lot of money. And according to Ford, and they focus group this thing to death, the average F-150 owner maximum has a daily range of 190-ish 100, to 170 miles, which this at 300 mile range, or let's say 250, worst case yeah. scenario, should cover you. The range is an issue because it can't do everything the gasoline version can do yet. And the truck is a work vehicle. Right, which right. Which you do drive a lot as a contractor. Yes, if, again, like the towing thing, as much as the marketing is like, oh, look what you can do. You can't tow long distance. So this rolls this out for a lot of people, but probably not a majority. Yes. Now let's talk about the uh, the, the generator part of this, Jack. So with uh, it changes the output based upon whether or not you have the small or big battery, but you have an onboard generator, which they call Pro Power Onboard, and you could theoretically power a, a work site with it, with some high power equipment. But the thing that they talk about in their marketing and now with power outages and whatnot, is the fact that you can power your home. However, there is some fine print behind that and Mark, walk me through that. So the maximum output of the generator because of the battery packs huge is about 9.7 kilowatts or, or there about maximum load, which to put in perspective, that's for a home generator, if you've got like a generic unit that's like five grand, it's the base is like 10 kilowatts. So it's really close to the home, home generation units, which when you see, see that like, and even the, the chief engineer, she's like, oh, I had a power outage. I could bring the truck home and plug it in and my family could still watch TV and we could have people over. It, it's nonsense because that, to do that at home, to power your home, you need a whole bypass panel. You need a, a whole grid set up to bypass your original uh, breaker box. So you have a secondary box. That's like 
four to five thousand dollars if not more for an electrician to come out to do that so there's still costs baked in it's cool you can do it but you have to set up your home to do it so don't think you can just plug your you know just plug the vehicle in your power outlet whoa and everything works it doesn't work like that but it's cool to see this technology and where it is now because in the future your trucks if you have the home built for that you will be able to power your home as a generator and you won't need to buy an external generator to your house within reason depending on where you're at but the the, the con to that is these things and we've, we're talking about this more is you're charging if you're going to be charging millions of f-150s and electric cars what is it going to do to the power grid <laughs> to, is it going to cause more brownouts where then you're like oh let me unplug my truck so i can power my house while the electric, electric grid recovers i mean it's a huge gray area yeah, it's the fine print that nobody's talking about yeah. and none of the oems when you ask these questions outside of maybe gm and we're going to be asking them yeah. in our our hummer video that we're doing and some other ev products are willing to give us answers about mark but with that i think it's time for us to take this thing for a drive because this is no longer a short shop segment I told you I wanted a real truck. I've had this Ridgeline on order for three months. Oh! <laughs> That's a real truck, Mark. <sighs> <laughs> Fucking house. I, everything about this feels wrong, doesn't it? Yeah, it's... Uh, so, I purposely went into this vehicle with the least number of opinions as possible right? i want to go into the totally blank slate to figure out a is this an f-150 that someone would probably buy again the f-150 is the most sold vehicle in north america or probably one of the most sold vehicles in the world and i think as an f-150 outside of the towing problem which we talked about in the shop this thing's pretty fucking amazing so tell me a little bit about what so you but we've been in every f-150 like yes. the eco boosts the v8s what is what is this? Is it just the same truck, just better, or is it worse from this? It's the same truck, but you know it has all the benefits from being an EV. You have an insane amount of power. It's 775 foot, foot pounds of torque and over 500 horsepower because it never has to downshift, never has to spool up any turbos. It's there all the time. So if you had this thing loaded up and you're going up a hill, there's no waiting to accelerate. It is very rigid. So it's very, very quiet as well. There's minimal NVH that makes its way into this cabin, and the cabin is still an F-150, which means probably it's the best truck interior. It's very, very usable. The frunk is amazing. I mean, there are really no complaints from a drivability perspective day in and day out. The range is around 300 miles. Real world with me driving like an asshole, I'm getting high-ish 200s, which to be fair, a five liter F-150 has about a four to 450 mile range for a gas tank. So I guess it's somewhat comparable. You do take a hit, but if you are gonna use this with how much gas costs today, it's, it's pretty substantial savings, I feel like. Yeah, so I guess the question is, because we get into this with a lot of the first gen EV conversation, this is really rare to talk about a full size truck, right? Like a full size usable truck. In my mind, there, you know, you're you're scratching out two key demographics: the long range haulers yes. and those that are towing. So if you're if you don't do those two things, which is a pretty important ass attribute of a truck, but if you're not doing that, in my approximation, I feel like this fixes a lot of the problems that I have with the F-150 because when we drove this, I'm like, I've always been lukewarm to the EcoBoost. They've kind of tinkered around with it, made some improvements, transmission logic stuff, all of the things that kind of hampered it. It always made me want to go to the V8. Now with this, assuming that the battery packs are reliable, the electric drivetrain is not a, a total disaster, this eliminates a lot of the complexity and issues of long-term ownership of something like this, aside from, of course, the fact that the range is can, can continue to improve. Battery density is gonna improve over the long haul. So this to me still, you know, you're gonna own it under warranty. Are you gonna keep this long-term? No. Like what, no. The okay. same problem I have with an iPhone, right? You yeah. know, or like any modern, big piece of technology in two to three years because of how quickly all of this tech is improving this i think will be left as a largely irrelevant product if you bought this day one but if you lease it or if you are a contractor and you have a fixed range yeah or someone who's buying this as a lifestyle vehicle you have a fixed range you're never going to drive more than 150 miles a day 
this is pretty amazing. Almost like using it in terms of like fleet mentality, right? Yes. You have your X, Y, and Z and points. You turn it you're in after three every years. Day. Yeah. yeah, you're charging when you start. It's full. You're charging at the end point, and then you're coming back and charging at full. It's always basically in that cycle. I think I could see the benefit of this. So let's talk about. You know, this is a lot of. We're talking about mentality. a lot of the mentality yeah. of EVs, of course, and we get hung up on this. Drivability, in my approximation, is just as good, if not better, than a regular F-150. The front end feels the same as a regular F-150 because you have independent in the rear. I think it rides a little better. I mean, I think if you've never driven an EV vehicle and you've gotten in this, you're, you are the core F-150 buyer. You've bought 15 F-150s. Yeah. Your father owned F-150s. If you got it in this, it still feels like an F-150, which and is a good it, thing. What it improves to is two key factors that typically, when you're talking about trucks, you that, that will change like your perception of what your, your expectations will go up. One, the quietness of the drivetrain. You have zero of the annoying, like trashy sounding, like engine tone. You don't have the transmission whine or any of the transfer case whine in this. It is very silent other than wind noise. And what's really going to do it for you is the raw acceleration and throwback of the torque from the electric drivetrain that you didn't really have before. If you if you pull up to the light and there's a first gen S550 V8 Mustang or S197, you're probably going to blow the doors off that thing like to 80 miles an hour. It is. And are people going to, is that really, do people really care about that in this? No, but I think at the same time, you're no longer, when you have this thing loaded up, you have a thousand pounds worth of shit in the bed or you're towing something, you're not going to be a burden to the people around you. You're not going to take 15 seconds to get up to highway speeds anymore. So for, now you're getting more usable torque and power to, to haul the ac excess weight of this thing and your cargo, but now you get the novelty of being able to treat it almost like it's a sports car off the line, something that you couldn't really do before. It was always like they were tuning it for, well, we have immediate torque, but you didn't have that high level of horsepower to keep pulling, and this does everything now, and that's the beauty of the EV drivetrain. It still has a, some of the shortcomings from an NVH and handling perspective of a regular F-150. It's still sort of a body on frame truck. Yeah. So there's that wobbliness yeah, to there, the front end. Is. You get the bobbles. It's not going to handle or turn in like a like a sports car. Or like a, uh, a regular unibody yeah. SUV. SUV yeah. yeah, for sure. But it, it, it's to me, it feels everything as much as an F-150, just improved on all the key points. The last thing to talk about is, we said this in the shop, how does it feel with the insane weight that this carries? Do you notice it in braking? Do you notice it in drivability? I'm going to be honest, the regular F-150 is so heavy to begin with. Like when we had that Raptor, the Raptor did not want to stop. Yeah. It didn't really want to turn. And this has those same characteristics. I think, again, if you're coming from a regular F-150 and you get into this, you're going to feel the immediate torque. You're going to notice the silence, the fact that the rear end feels a little bit more compliant. But past that, feels like a regular F-150, which is why I think this is so impressive as a starting point for trucks. And I think I'm interested to see what the Rivian's like and what the Hummer's like from a practical perspective, not a novelty perspective, because for this thing, the fact that it's... It, this is a real yeah. truck. Like that, that's To me, that's the huge benefit of this. It's not trying to be gimmicky. It's not trying to be like, oh, I'm an EV. It, it really is. You truck. close your eyes, it's an F-150 through and through with the added benefits of an EV drivetrain. I think that's why it's going to be so successful, Jack. So with that, Mark, let's head into the final thoughts. All right. Final thoughts on the F-150 Lightning. This is a product, for the most part, that has been made better by an electric drivetrain. It's faster than its internal combustion counterpart. It has more torque. It is a quieter vehicle. It rides better with its independent rear suspension. And there's less overall NVH in the cabin as a whole. Not to mention the fact that in some ways it's more practical than its ICE counterpart. With a frunk, you finally have a space that is enclosed where you can store your dirty things without any issues. However, there are some compromises with this vehicle. The biggest one is when it comes to towing. If you are going to tow heavy loads, your range is going to be less than 100 miles, which will eliminate this for many people. But ignoring that, if you live within the confines of what this electric truck can do, you'll be really happy with it because it's really just a normal F-150 with an electric drivetrain, which is why this thing is pretty great. So with that, thanks for watching, and I hope in the future we can deliver some more technical information on the F-150 Lightning. Masterclass in the peekaboo shot. Oh.